I mean, it was the, the strange thing about really bad concussion and swallowing your tongue and being unconscious for that 17 minutes. You don't remember it. You don't tend to be scared of stuff you can't remember. Uh, Will, cheers for coming on. I know you're a busy guy, so uh, I thought we'd get a World Cup winner on. But yeah. what we normally do with this is go back to... your listeners that uh, your tech is so bad that uh, even though you invited me onto this call, and to this call, <laughs> I've invited you onto the Zoom link. I am recording it and I am sending it back to you. So just need you know people to understand where we are in the in the tech I think that's the difference between rugby union and rugby league. Rugby league uh, players are generally a little bit thicker. Rugby union, that's why you've uh, got the better education. I'm a complete Luddite with computers. So if you're below me, you're almost Neanderthal. Well, that, that's what I mean. Well, uh, I've got all these sticky notes around there. I keep seeing that 80 year old women are using Zoom. It's no problem at all. So I've just right. spent 25 minutes trying to get this sorted out. But uh, cheers for coming on. I know he's in bed and we just. Far away. What do we need? What are we talking about? We normally go back to how you got into rugby. Like rugby league's always the same story. It's normally council estate. It's a way out, trying to make a living. How, how, how did you get into rugby? Uh, sort of, my mum and dad are both teachers, and my dad was actually an England rugby player in the sixties and coached England in the eighties. So I was the eldest son. I have an elder sister, but I was the eldest boy. So I was the first lad who followed him everywhere and went to training and. We'd go to Preston Grasshoppers and run the legs off a couple of rotund gentlemen playing in Division 4. I mean, if they caught me, they'd rip my head off, but they couldn't catch me. Uh, so the tra- and I just grew up in and around men's rugby as a young kid, learning to look after myself, learning to fend for myself. And, uh, and more importantly, which is why I tell all the kids who play sport, just kept turning up. Um, yeah, yeah. Keep turning up. Someone will pick you in the end and give you a pass. Um, so it's more about endurance and perseverance that I have in my locker rather than any innate skill set. Because then when you have perseverance and endurance and durability, you begin to accumulate the 10,000 hours that everyone talks about. And everyone goes, wow, look how gifted you are. And the reality is, mm, I just turned up and did a little and often and kept playing and kept learning. I was in the under 16 C's at school. I was in the university third team when I went away at college. Um, but something clicked eventually and um, away we go. So sport, I wouldn't necessarily, I never thought of rugby as a career because the union version is amateur. I went to college and I worked in, I went to London and got a job in finance. And it was only in 96, after the famous World Cup of 95 with Nelson Mandela and Francois Pino where Everyone went, this is show business, this is that They saw a flood of players going north, stopped, and they started going south, and they started going the other way. Um, and I was in that first tranche of, of professional rugby players at the back end of the last century. How different was it going from the amateur game to the professional game? Because it must have been a big jump, and was there a few players that didn't want to make the jump because you're making so much money in your, your day job and yeah, things like so that? Yeah, I mean, that's... I mean, I, I, I'm hesitant to say making so much money, but the reality was what I was earning in the city. And rugby first went professional. I wasn't an English player. I was a sort of second team at Harlequin. Will Carlin was in the first team at my position. So I was, would play when he wasn't playing. Occasionally play alongside him. Um, so my ranking, your rating, you know, if you're looking at time form in terms of your horses, my rating was pretty rubbish. So the contract offer I got was, I don't mind, but it was got a three-year deal of 20 grand a year. Uh, take it or leave it. So I went, well, I'll leave it. And so I'll go up the road to Rosman Park and, and play amateur and not get paid and keep my job in the city because I'm earning more than that. I think my dad says he didn't, but I'm pretty sure he just had a quiet word with Peter Weaver at Leicester and said, look, Will's about to turn his back on pro rugby. Probably didn't give him a shout. So I met him in a service station after the M1, I think it was Poddington. Um, and he said, why don't you come to Leicester? I said, well, okay, this is, what, this is what I'm earning. Always very transparent, this is what I'm earning. And uh, he goes, all right, well, let's match that and let's put a little bit on for relocation fee and come and do it for two years and see how we get off. And we went, all right, job done. So, so that's, that's what it was in, in those days. And, you know, the top, 
top club contracts in those days were sort of 40, 50 grand, 60 grand, something like that. So, certainly not mega bucks. Did your game improve when you went full time? Because it sounds like uh, I can remember going to a North of England trial and they used to always say to people that didn't get picked, don't worry if you don't get picked. Will Green would never got picked. That was always the part in line for people that yeah, didn't get picked. I'm a, a pioneer of failure. I am, I'm a pioneer advocate of falling flat on your ass early on and, uh, and, and persevering. So, um, yeah, I was I just the reason that I didn't I didn't play to play for England. It's because I loved it. I loved all sport, you know. I still go down my local rugby club at Maidbed now, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and run around with the lads and coach a little bit. But I like the coaching, but I prefer still running about and running a, an inside line and an angle and, and, and siding through. Although siding through at my age and my pace, is, I mean, you need a strobe light at training to actually see if I'm chopping moving. Um, so that, that's why I do it. So it was all anything that gave me higher honours there's always a bonus rather than I didn't dream of that it wasn't my waking hour I just couldn't wait until the next train because you weren't a traditional like uh, inside type of centre either were you like at that time when you went professional you had a lot of rugby league lads coming over people were taking the weights dead serious you were always a player I liked when I, I I watched because you, you played with a bit of a smile on your face and you used your like strengths to their weaknesses. You didn't just think, oh, there's John Lomu, I'll bump him off. You yeah. sort of used your brain a little bit. Yeah, so it's better than smiling your face. You try and disarm people. Try and get them not, try and get the big lungs to lightweight to, to not concentrate for a second. Uh, to, and maybe to try and like you so they don't um, remove a ribcage or create a hole in your ribcage when they hit you. So, uh, yeah, there's there's so many different ways. Rugby is a contact sport, and you can't get away from the fact that it's a north-south game. You have to go that way to do anything, not across. But you can. I mean, I teach math, and without get you know, you can apply some sort of vector theory. I can get there, just going a little bit that way and a little bit that way, and I still end up there. Ideally, that's the shortest route. And for those who are listening on the podcast, I'm sort of say you don't have to go from your own trial line directly up the middle of the field to the opposition trial line. You can just float down, skirt down, uh, and get to the same point, maybe with a little bit more energy expended, but with the same result by with a different style. And I think it's the great teams are packed with players who can do things in a very different way and apply those individual strengths within the collective environment according to the obstacles you see in front of you. And that reactive ability separates the good teams from the great teams, the great teams from the good teams. Were you, were you shocked when you got picked for the England team, considering that you think about giving it rugby and Will Carl was getting his spot earlier on and then you moved clubs and did it come as a bit of a shock? Is that when you started thinking, I could make a, I could make a real name for myself now? The shock was being picked for the line before I played uh, for England. So I, I don't want to put my foot in it, but basically I know when you have the Rugby League World Cup, you represent England. But, uh, and it might not quite be a good enough analogy, but when you played against the Aussies in the very old days, it was great, it was great Britain. Uh, am I right in set that spot? Yeah, in Rugby League, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you tend to normally get picked for England before you get picked for Great Britain. You have a couple of games for England <laughs> before you play for Great Britain. So it might not work, quite work the same in Rugby League, but it, it, that's the normal route for international rooms here. You play for England or Wales or Ireland or Scotland first. Then you go on Alliance Tour, which is the best of everyone, to one of the big countries. And in 97, uh, I went to South Africa as a British Lion before I'd been picked for England. So I did it sort of about face. And the, because of the fact I went on Alliance Tour, and so, when I say survived, I coped with it on the rugby side. I actually picked for a really serious injury, but I coped with it in terms of the rugby. But... Uh, it wasn't. Did that knock your confidence a little bit when you got that bad head injury? And bit well, 
I mean, it was the, the strange thing about really bad concussion and swallowing your tongue and being unconscious for that 17 years. You don't remember it. You don't tend to be scared of stuff you can't remember. So yeah. I can't really remember what happened. So everyone was like, wow, he, how brave is he coming back from that to play again? I said, well, I, I can't remember what, what happened. So I'm not really that brave. Well, I, I remember when I got my teeth knocked out and I can remember months after that, you were going, I, I can remember even in my mind thinking, you're going into tackles thinking, I hope they don't get knocked out again, you know, when you get your falls, because it cost a fortune, don't get your teeth fixed. I just thought if you've been knocked out badly, that was one of the worst concussions you could probably have. Yeah. Uh, maybe it just had a knock-on effect, but... It's actually, the shoulder, the shoulder problems are always going to come back. And anything that, anytime you look at a joint in your body and you know something's pointing in the wrong direction and it really hurts, and you know that it was done because you got the tackle slightly wrong, those are the ones that I've got a few definitions for uh, people coming back for knee injuries where they snap their ACLs. Um, I'm not in any way, in any way, undermining the severity of concussion. My point is, the concussion I had was so bad, I couldn't remember it. Because I couldn't remember it, there's nothing to be worried about. And it, it, it's one of them with injuries that people don't realise that if you play any level of sport, like rugby, at any sort of level, you, you're going to have these injuries where you're out for quite a while, isn't it? Did, did you find it tough? Because in any club that you play at, everyone's like, oh, how's your knee? And that's all they'll ask, isn't it? You know what I mean? You've got to do six months of rehab, going to swimming pools and things like that. That's the bits that people don't realise. Was there any times when you were doing that thinking, I could easily get a job outside of rugby, I could give this up, or were you always determined to come back? I've always been strong on, on short-term challenges. I'm not quitting on challenges. Coming back from injury were, were those short-term challenges. You, you didn't want to concede. The reality is when I retired in 06, I was nearly 34. And it wasn't one injury. It was just hurting every bloody day. Uh, not, not all. I wasn't falling apart. I'm not going to... I don't want to sit there and dramatise that rugby ruined me. I'm, I like my CrossFit now and I train with the lads. And I can run around and I can do a 20 minute 5k and, you know, all that sort of stuff. I, so I'm very lucky to still do all that. But rugby both code. You've got to have the right mindset and you go, go on, go on. You do get it and that's no fun. Um, so, in the end, it was sort of that slow change in mindset that meant I had to call it a day. Because my brain could still see the gap, my body just couldn't get there. Earlier on in your career, you just determined to come back stronger and fitter and better when you have injuries. Now, it can be pretty soul destroying if you have the back injuries and it goes again, or you're not getting the help you need, or they're not quite sure what it is. And so you're, you're trying one thing that's not working, those are the stuff down. But the, the very, not sad truth, but just the reality of being involved in this is at some stage you will spend a considerable amount of time on a physio bench, crook. Yeah. Because that's the nature of the game. So if you don't want to do that, then go and play football. Well, ah, you, you talk about... Uh you were talking about mindset and uh, from outside looking in, that World Cup team that obviously went on to win, I, I'm sure it was only a couple of years before you ranked like eighth in the world and you went with the same coach and the players didn't change massively. How did you go from being like the eighth ranked team in the world to being World Cup champions? Was there a massive shift in training or was it just a mindset? Uh, the plenty of selection helps. You just, well, it, never, it doesn't tend to be one thing you improve by 100% tends to be like you do a load of, load of things improve by 1%. And if you've got a coach who's, you know, Clyde nearly lost his job after the 99 World Cup, but kept it, so we had the stability to build again and take those lads from the 99 World Cup that had been beaten in the quarter final. But the lads from within that squad that he felt actually handled the situation well, and remove those that didn't, and then slowly add new young players from through, and then go and recruit someone like Jason Robinson to add a bit of firework and razzle dazzle. Um, then, yeah, it's a slow process, and eventually the team starts to 
pick off the victories that they said to be losing by two or three points. Instead, they win it by two or three points. You get on a roll. Um, and before you know it, you're number one team in the world and you're beating everyone home and away. So um, the, it's the mindset. It's a chicken or egg. Get to 2 or 3. We, we would have beaten, we would have said we could beat anyone anyway. But we couldn't say we could have beaten anyone ever unless we were completely control of our basics and our skill set and understanding our calls and our plays and our system, uh, which takes time on the training field. So that contributes to the mindset and the mindset contributes to the belief that whatever you do will work. So it's this beautiful virtuous loop of success. The downside that is if it works going that way, spiraling ever upwards, it also works going the other way, spiraling ever downwards when it starts to go wrong. And uh, it, it always comes across dead serious with the rugby and that, but I can remember reading about, I'm sure it was before you played New Zealand, and Clive Woodward would say, I wouldn't swap any player in the other team for any player on your team. And you come up with something quite comical about John Lomu, because they had John Lomu on the wing. Can you remember? Can you remember that story? Yeah, so I think Clive attributed it to me. I'm pretty sure it was Jason Leonard who said it, but I think that Jason's a lot tougher than me, so people can get away with sticking my name to it and know that there won't be any retribution. Uh, it was just, it sort of, it, it chronologically sort of takes you through where the team was, because in 1900, it, it is right that a coach should stand up and say, I'd back every single one of you against any single one of them. The reality was, looking back in hindsight, you, you could have Joe and Eleven, but you'd get him in the team and you'd throw out four of your lads. Uh, <laughs> but by the time you get to the serious side of that conversation, by the time you get to the other three World Cup, you ask us the same question, you wouldn't swap anyone from, anywhere, from anywhere. Any year, you can keep them. The lads we want in that change room for that final on that night are the 22 lads who in that change room for that final for that night. Um, and so that, that apocryphal story has grown up uh, and, and is a sort of fable and a tale that actually chronologically tells you the transition that, that team was going. Well, what was it like playing against someone like John Lomer? Because he was huge he could do the 100 meters in 11 seconds he had a, a good fend off a bump at a sidestep do, do you have to prepare yourself a little bit different for something like that or did, did you try and get up in defense on him or yeah. or did you just let him play normally all those all those things try and cut off possession and make sure the ball doesn't get to him the ball gets to him, make sure there's eight lads waiting for him um but even then you you know at some stage you just got to throw yourself in front of him and hope you slow him down, and then someone else will do the same thing. And if six of you do it, eventually you might slow to a standstill, and you've got half a chance of stopping. And he was an extraordinary talent, extraordinary boost. And actually, New Zealand have just done it for another lad called Caleb Clark, who played at the weekend. He's already been sort of described as the next Jonah, and uh, the Kiwis have this ability through their connections in the South Sea Pacific and the genetic makeup of individuals um, from from those incredible islands that means just huge huge men to, to try and combat on a rugby field and they just don't have the funding either as all these top nations I, I watched a documentary on like how much money Tonga had they were training on parks for the World Cup and things like that to think these these teams compete with the top teams in rugby is amazing, really, considering the pool of talent they can pick from. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it brings such... Certainly the short form of the game, the sevens, Fiji have been wonders. The 2016 Olympic final in Rio is one of the great rugby performances of all time. So, yeah, World Rugby has to make sure it's equitable in terms of dividing up monies. And we know that there's the rich commercial powerhouses of New Zealand and England. They fill stadiums when you can fill stadiums and demand huge television rights. But at World Cups, you've got to keep striving to make it a more global sport. For being is still very much a Commonwealth sport if you look at the countries at play. But with its inclusion in the Olympics, 
that's spreading. Uh, and uh, I think what you've seen over the course of the last three or four World Cups, that certainly in the 90s, late 80s, when the first World Cup was in 87 and the 90s, there were only three teams who could win it. Yeah, yeah. And then we won it. We're the only Northern Hemisphere team still to have won it. France have made three finals. Uh, Wales keep knocking on the door. Uh, they've had a semi in 2011 and a semi final in 2019. Uh, and so it's the, an Argentina are now at the top table. And that's the challenge is to turn up to a World Cup where, I mean, it's a bit like the Champions League. It's like, we'll rail the middle, buy a Munich. Yeah, yeah. And the man turn up, and Man United start winning a couple, and Chelsea at the top table, and Dortmund are in there. You start adding, and that's the key to make Barcelona's and obviously all the teams that missed out. But people like watching sports where you don't already know the winner. I'd, that's why boxing and MMA is so popular, isn't it, when you have a 50-50 fight because you don't know who's going to win. Yeah. And it's the same, like you say, with rugby. And I, I think on the World Cup side of things, when you lot were in the World Cup, I don't know if you knew that when you offered it, did, did you realise the whole country was behind you? Because I remember going up the street, people were like, oh, you're going to go and watch the semi-final, you're going to go and watch it. These are people that weren't into rugby before, and, but because it's our national team doing really well, which we're not used to, Everyone was getting behind you. Did, did you feel like when you're in Australia, do you think, oh my God, there's people in Whitehaven, there's people in Wigan, there's people in London all cheering us, or did you just get on with it as normal? I know what I say very well, very visible and flat and windy, and it's just feeling a bit simple. Uh, so I think we didn't quite realise the enormity of what was going on back home, but the noise was building and the stadium there were people jumping on planes to get out to the semi-final and finally you were turning up at the Sydney Olympic Stadium to the semi-final and the final and it was a sea of white you think it really had quite a lot of people are spending a lot of money to come to watch it uh, so without ever we sort of understood it when we did the lap of London before we went to Buckingham Palace and how many people turned up on the street but at the time uh, we had an amazing captain, Martin Johnson, who kept our feet on the ground, uh, didn't let us sort of listen to people telling us how good we were when we won, and didn't let people listen too much to people telling us how bad we were when we lost. And uh, it, it allowed us as players really just to focus on doing the little things right all the time, which gives you the best chance of winning. How, how important was that pack of forwards that you had in the World Cup? Because if I've ever played rugby union, I, th I think a lot of the work the forwards do doesn't get noticed. So you've got people like yourself scoring tries, Jason Robinson making these runs, Johnny Wilkinson kicking the goals. And I think people forget the work the forwards do. But you had like Lewis, Neil Bax, Lewis Moody's, all these Delalio types. They would put the head where you wouldn't put your feet. Was that a confidence thing? When you went into a match thinking, we've got Martin Johnson, we've got these, there isn't a pack of forwards. Because they were... You described them as a horrible pack of forwards, and I wouldn't want to play against that pack at the Rook. The pack of forwards were tremendous and uh, very selfless. So they knew what they had to do, and they knew where uh, to give the ball up, and they might not necessarily get their name in neon lights or headlines. But we were all just happy to be part of a collective success, and it didn't matter who scored. Um, and you've got to have a pack that prepared to do things that no one else would and do the jobs that no one else would in order to get the medal and pick up the trophy come, come the final whistle. What, what was it like playing outside Johnny Wilkinson? Because I've seen a lot of interviews with Johnny and it, it seems a bit of a tortured soul. I don't think you realise that the impact he's had on so many people and he seemed to beat himself up a lot, you know, like, oh, you won the game, but I missed two. Do you know, he had that sort of mentality. Was, was he like that as a person or was it, is he great to play outside of? I think, you know, I clearly dropped the goal. He's an incredible guy and won three European Cups for too long. The reality is, most of the team had a similar mindset. If you ask me about what I remember about World Cup, or I'll tell you about the near misses and the ones that got away, and, and those are the things that put you back on the training field so you don't 
feel like that. But there's no doubt he took that to, you know, to the next level. Uh, extraordinary young man. His training, his capacity to hurt himself on a training field and get the best out of himself is something I've trained with some pretty special people before then, but he raised the bar again. Uh, and his goal kicking, which, you know, we do like to score tries, but you get to World Cup and knockouts and can your marksman bang over more than their marksman? And you just see the European Champions Cup last week and extra being lauded is an unbelievable team. But you, you look at the details, it was 31 27, four tries each, one penalty each, one team kick four conversions, one team, team kick two conversions. And that's yeah. the brutality of sport. They're absolutely evenly matched, apart from the time that Joe Simmons had a kick, as opposed to Finn must have had a kick. Uh, Joe's went over, Finn's didn't. And a whole team and a whole city are celebrating. And a whole team and a whole city are desperately disappointed to have lost another final. Uh, and it's that tight. And, and so in, in the big stakes rugby games, in the big stakes football games, when it comes to penalties or cricket games, and someone's got to go, stick a century on under pressure, your Steve Smiths. But then no, those are the players that tend to get looked at more and analysed more. But I think Johnny would be pretty confident saying he just felt he was another pawn, another chess piece in the game. And we all tried to work as hard as each other. He just Some just set great examples 100% of the time. Uh, never took the foot off the gas and he was one of them. Well, I, I've talked to Jason Robinson a number of times and he, he said the same thing. He, he said, going into the World Cup, everyone had the job to do. So Johnny's job's to kick. So he knew going, he said, if that kick had come, like the pass had come back to Jason Leonard, Jason Leonard or someone like that would know, I'm not taking this drop goal. I just settle in and it goes to someone who kicks. And he said, that, that was a difference in that team. He said, everyone just done the little things right, but consistently over a, a period of time, that's how they started getting better. But I... I I can't imagine how nervous you must have been on that field when it goes to Golden Point in a World Cup final. Do, do you feel that nerves, or is it just one of them? You, you blanked it all out. You're, you're in a final. Just, just do your job. You're just doing your job. It's the next tackle, it's the next pass. Uh, it's the fans that go through the uh, roller coaster of emotion. Oh, we could have scored, and now we're defending. Oh, what a great tackle! And oh, I thought we were going to score. It's just out on the field, uh, you're just going through the processes. And you're all cogs in the machine and you're trying to make sure that your cog keeps turning so the machine keeps rolling. Um, so, yeah, there was the nerves are during the week before the game. Once, once you're on game day, once you're running out, it's great fun, man. I mean, you're playing the World Cup final in front of a lot of people. You're doing stuff a lot of people just give a kidney for. Um, you've got to enjoy it. And, you know, I love the, love, love the night. Didn't play that well. A uh, couple of errors. Still great. We've got a loose balls in contact. Uh, tackled all right. But just proud to be part of a team that in an Olympic stadium, in an Australian Olympic stadium, with some amazing players in the Australian team who were going for back to back World Cups. We've won it in 99. But um, when the final whistle went, we had more points than them. I don't, we never really beat. We didn't really beat Australia. We just had just like a photo finish with the, with the horses. Who's, who's when the photo goes? Who's got their nose in? It's been another ten minutes. Then they might have won it. In another five minutes, we might have won it. And it was just so happened that we put ourselves in a position, used the clock, understood the clock, took the, took the three points, and it was time to take three points, and. and uh, we, we win, but the, my opposite man, Sterling Morlock, I mean, his shit got me. Did I beat Sterling Morlock? Nah, what an amazing competitor he was. Uh, my team just had our noses in front, but that doesn't mean I'm a better player than they are. Uh, but before we go, obviously, strap for time and things. Um, who, who, who was the best player you think you played against or with? I know it's hard to do because there's forwards and backs, but is there anyone that sticks out and you think, he, he was just something a little bit special. I mean, we've talked a lot about the England players. So I've got it. I'd have all of them in my team, but I'm a lad who's, I think he's 
sent me back to Cronulla. Um, I think it was, I don't know which one believes in you, I think he was witness. Uh, Alan Bateman. Oh, the, the, the like centre winger type of guy. He's like a sidestepper type player, wasn't he? That's it. So I played with him in the Lions tour in 97. And he was known as the clown. Batman, as I called him, Alan Bateman. Batman was special. Uh, and certainly over the course of the career, playing with Tyndall, uh, Mike Carr, and Johnny, and Jason, Black, and what a team was great. But for, for romance and for a short space of time in a 97 Lions tour, which we won in South Africa. They were sort of a magical four or five games out on the field in South Africa with Batman alongside me. I just thought he's properly. No, no. I, well, cheers for coming on, Will. And uh, I'm going to st- go do some online courses with tech or something in the next couple of weeks and I'll, yeah. I'll start getting that. Yeah, I'll start improving my good. game on that. Well, I'm a very patient man and realise I'm a good soldier. <laughs> if you had that sort of calamitous error, with Martin Johnson, oh crap, they don't want on you. See, that's the kind of bloke I am. I stuck it out and we got we got it, we got it done. That's all that matters. That's a difference, Will. We played in the same position. You won a World Cup and I was useless. So that, that's probably that's a mentality thing there. So, But uh, cheers for coming on, pal.